let's talk about the 12 steps in machine learning and AI. And yes, in order to make it 12, I had to start at zero. So step zero is check the prerequisites. Do you have the right application for machine learning, the right hardware, and the right people in charge? I've got a checklist for you on that. Don't go further if you failed some items on that checklist. Right, if you're in the game, step one, define your objective. What does success actually look like? Once you've thought about that, step two is get your data. Step three, one of the most important steps here, is to split your data into three data sets, or even better, into four data sets. And make sure that you keep track of which data point went to which data set and never mix them up. That was a really big mistake. Don't do that. You will get eaten alive by the worst enemy in machine learning called overfitting. Overfitting, roughly, is that beautiful situation where you get wonderful results in the same data where you trained your model. And then when you actually apply the model to where it's supposed to work, you know, in the new stuff, it fails miserably. You do not want that situation. You don't want overfitting to eat you alive. So split your data. In better, split it at the infrastructure level if you can. And make sure that you don't allow anyone to access data sets in the wrong step. Step four is explore some data. So you're going to look at your training data and you're going to figure out what potential inputs might be useful for creating the model, the recipe that gets you from the inputs to desired outputs or labels, because that's what this is all about. You're doing some thing labeling, essentially. Then step five, that's where you're going to set up your tools. You're going to massage your data a little bit so that it can be accepted by various packages like scikit-learn or TensorFlow, PyTorch, what have you, and prepare the code for a list of algorithms you might like to try, everything from random forests, linear regression, neural networks, whatever you like. You can't just take any old data set and shove it into any old algorithm. Usually there's a bit of massaging in between and you're going to have to do that prep work. You're not only going to try one tool, the beauty of machine learning, the beauty of taking this approach with the split data sets is on your training data. You're going to throw everything at it until something sticks. And then you're going to massage that potential solution towards something better. So even if you think something won't work, but you can try it quickly, just try it and may the best algorithm win. Right. So once you've prepared the things to try in step six, you know what's coming, you're going to try them. You're going to train some models. Simply, you'll take your data and you'll shove it through some algorithms and then you will check performance in the same data set. And that performance will be too good to be true, which is why I've got all these other steps coming up. Step seven is where you're going to debug and tune your model. So you're going to tune some hyperparameters. What's a hyperparameter? It's just a knob or a dial that's on that algorithm that you have to set to something to run it at all. And you have no idea what you're going to set it to. Just like when you get a toaster right out the box and it's got a dial and you don't know if you should set it to three or seven because you've never run that toaster before. Well, first time through, I'm just going to pick your favorite number or your friend's favorite number who's used that toaster before. But if you find that you like working with this toaster, you're going to tune it up a little bit. So that's your tuning phase where you find some principled way to uh, put settings on the algorithms that you're trying. If you get surprising results you don't like, your models misbehave, you also do some debugging there. Uh, and you can always go back to an earlier step, by the way, you can always backtrack if you want to. Then in step eight, you're going to validate your model. Validation is where you take a data set that you never look inside. That's debugging. You do that in step seven on a different data set if you want to. So in validation, you take a data set, never look inside it. You apply your candidate models to this data set and you see how they do on data that they have not explicitly seen before. In other words, you didn't when you do training in step six, you contort your solution to fit the data that you've given it for training. So it's always going to work a little too well in that data. Now you're going to give it new ish data that it never has explicitly seen before. And you're going to see how it does on the new stuff because that's what you care about. Can it succeed on new data? That's the big goal here in machine learning to create a recipe or a model that actually works on new data. So that's what validation is all about. You're going to get some scores out. The only thing you get is that score or number. You see if you like it. 
The difference between validation and test is that validation is a reusable um, scoring for your model. Testing, on the other hand, is a statistical test of performance that you do one time and one time only. And if you don't like what you see there, you've got two options. Pens down or go get a completely different, fresh, pristine, unused for anything test data set. So by the time you get to testing, this is serious business. You better make sure that you're pretty confident in your validation results you're only going to take your very favorite finished final model to testing. Getting testing wrong is a great way to release poisonous garbage onto the world. Please don't do it. And it is important that you have a proper statistical approach there in step nine. Now, the decision that you're making in step nine is essentially, does this model perform well enough for me to productionize it? It's going to be a second decision step later in step 11, hold your horses. Should I productionize it? If the answer is yes, in step 10, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to put it into production. You're going to add some bells and whistles for it actually operating and playing nicely with the rest of your production systems. You're going to add in some fun additional things like automated retraining. You're going to add in some monitoring. You're going to think about how long does this model stay fresh before you need to update it. And that really depends on how stable you think your universe is what kind of thing you're solving. If you are solving translating from English to Japanese and you don't think that English and Japanese change that often, that quickly, well, maybe your model will be good for months or years. But if you're building a spam detector, and you know your spammers are going to mess with you first opportunity they get, and if they've got a new way to uh, make your life a misery after a day or a week, well, then you're going to have to keep retraining and adjusting your model to deal with its new circumstances on the order of days or weeks. So you've got to think carefully about that. Logging and the policy filters and all that kind of good stuff, that happens in step 10. Step 11, and this is the other big decision point, this is the live traffic experiment. Before you decide to trust your model for realsies and rely on it at 100%, you're going to first take some of your cases that you're labeling like maybe it's photographs and you're classifying whether it's a cat or not cat, or maybe it's sentences that go from Japanese to English, what have you. If this is a system that interacts live with users, you're going to go cautiously. And what you'll do is you will show some of your users answers that come from your machine learning system. And at random, some other users are going to see answers that come from your next best system. Maybe something based on, I don't know, serving the answer at random. Right, here's a photograph, is a cat, not cat. This one is classified by your machine learning algorithm. This one is a coin toss. And see what the different behaviors are. See what your users do in response. See how well the system performs live. And what you're going to do there is you're going to be finding the impact of your system relative to the next best candidate, which hopefully is something better than a coin toss. And if you see that the impact is sufficiently large to justify launching the system and having it be your primary solution, well then, you've passed step 11 and you move to step 12. Step 12, monitor and maintain forever. Reliability is really important. And you've got to have a really, really high standard of documentation because it would be great to chain those engineers who made it to a wall and, you know, never let them leave and they have to keep maintaining their system that they built. But that's not humane. So we let them go on to other jobs, but they had better leave a nice stack of documentation so that whoever comes next can learn what they knew. Well, that knowledge shouldn't reside in the heads only of the machine learning engineers who built your system. That is bad planning. Your documentation standards have to be much, much higher here. This is the gift that keeps giving. So you're going to keep maintaining your system ad infinitum. So those are the 12 steps of machine learning. I'm Cassie Kozarkov. Hope you had fun here. Don't forget to uh, hit like, subscribe, and most importantly, if you liked it, share it with a friend. If you hated it, share it with an enemy. That way everyone wins, and I'll catch you next time.